But right now, we have to start with our coverage out in Broward County, Florida, where a verdict was reached on Thursday in the penalty phase of confessed Parkland school shooter Nicholas Cruz. This is the man who spent nearly three months on trial to decide if he would spend the rest of his life in prison or be put on death row. This all for the mass shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School back in 2018, where he took the lives of 17 people and injured 17 others. The jury took a total of seven and a half hours to reach the decision on the shooter's fate. So let's watch a snippet of what was read aloud in court. Okay, the defendant having previously been, um, has he been adjudicated? adjudicated of 17 counts of murder in the first degree, the jury having returned a verdict of life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, is there any legal reason why I should not impose a sentence at this time? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And that is under 921.143, the victims under counts 1 through 17, and also the surviving victims of the attempted homicides have a right to express themselves as to the um, everything that could not be expressed under victim impact. They can express themselves as to crime, and what they think should have been the appropriate disposition and sentence. That is, it is anticipated that that could be a lengthy sentencing hearing because it applies to all 34 counts of the indictment. Okay, are you prepared to present that testimony now? No, we're not, Your Honor. And under the statute, it says that the victims have a right to present that testimony and also, as you know, under the Florida Constitution, the victims have a right to be heard and that the victim should present that testimony before you announce sentence. Okay, so the jury came back and they recommended life in prison, not the death penalty for Nicholas Cruz. There's going to be a sentencing hearing at a later date in November. And before we chat about this, I do want to show you a reaction from one of the victim's parents following this monumental verdict. Take a look. It's been 1,703 days since the murderer committed the mass shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. And if this was not the most perfect death penalty case, All right, so it kind of got a little paused right there. Let's talk about this. Again, I said that there was a sentencing hearing in November, uh, but there is also a hearing today at 1.30 regarding a juror issue. Let's talk about it. I'm joined right now by my very good friend and guest here, uh, litigator Richard Schoenstein, who's been following this case with me. You were on the air with me yesterday as we covered this. We talked all about it. Let's talk about the latest development that's happening at 1.30. So apparently... There is an allegation that one of the jurors feels that, that she was threatened by another juror. Um, and this is interesting because the way that we understand it is that it looks like one juror was definitely in favor of life and then two other jurors had sided with this juror. So uh, the state has filed a number of different uh, uh, pleadings here. They filed a, a motion. Um, a, a state motion to uh, interview this juror. They also gave the notice to the opposing counsel about this. Um, and then we also had a copy of this juror note uh, that was delivered to the judge, basically suggesting that this juror, you know, didn't go into these proceedings indicating that she was always going to vote for life in prison. She kept an open mind, but ultimately decided, uh, based on all the evidence, to vote in favor of life. This is strange, right? If there is, if it's proven that if one juror was threatened by another or there was this kind of problems in the jury room, could this taint the verdict? Well, this is really uncharted territory. And I have to say, you might have to go get a smarter legal analyst than me to figure all of this out because I don't see a path here for disrupting the jury verdict. You think about these things, usually it's the other way around. Usually it's the defense who is complaining about some juror after there's been a conviction or after there's been a sentence imposed. And then we look into it very carefully. And if there's a problem with a juror, you might declare a mistrial and do it all over again. But when the error is in reverse, I, I can't think of any situations where that has undone a verdict, especially in a case like this, where the jury came in not unanimously recommending the death penalty. Even assuming the worst of what we've heard so far, even if we assume that one juror came in 
predisposed not to impose the death penalty, I don't know what the avenue would be for altering anything. Yeah, and, and I think that's what's so fascinating about this. And Asha, I, I want to get a little bit more to the reaction from the family. So this is Max Schachter. Uh, again, another parent uh, who lost a loved one, lost a child in this. Um, and this is the reaction post-verdict. Yeah, I, I was worried when I saw that. And I think what we're going to find out is that there was a lot of tension in, in that jury room. And... Um, you know, we don't we don't know what happened. We'll we'll find out. But it, it was just uh, you listen to all the evidence and 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 understanding what he did uh, to murder, going up and down all those three floors of stairs and hunting down uh, all of his victims, shooting them from down the hall, and then going over and executing them at point blank range. How, how could you how could you not give him the death penalty? And I, I think that that one juror that, that voted for life is going to live to regret that uh, for the rest of his life. Obviously, those comments are very understandable, right? But I am curious if you think this juror will regret that decision. Um, because this is, imagine being the one holdout or maybe, you know, and convincing two others to come on the side, if that's really what happened. But being one holdout in this kind of case, that is the, the um, I guess you want to say for the prosecution, the risk of jury of a, of a jury panel, but also it's the the beauty of our jury system as well. Right. The the glory of our system is that you you have to be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And if we want to impose the death penalty, we have this very rigorous procedure in Florida where you have to get a jury unanimously to recommend the death penalty and then get the judge to sign off on it. And I totally understand the family's frustration and anger and emotion. You know, they sat there for three months, stoically and heroically, watching this trial, participating in the trial when they need to, when they needed to, keeping quiet during it all, during all of the proceedings, and now to have the air let out like it was yesterday, where they don't get the verdict that, that most of them wanted and most of them expected, and all of the emotions are coming flooding out. I totally understand their reaction. You know, there was a part of it yesterday when we were watching it. We never predicted if the jury was going to decide uh, for the death penalty that they were going to decide the death for one of the victims, but not others. But there was a part yesterday as they were going through each one of the victims and they had to determine, you know, read the verdict form for each one. I felt the sense that perhaps each juror, each family member was waiting for the possibility of it to come forward with death penalty. You know, every answer was no, 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 but it was kind of, I think they were all hoping that maybe the jury would come back with the death penalty with respect to uh, one of those victims. It just didn't happen. Now, 